So also, uh, these linearized gravitational fields are characterized by the way uh, their wave functions in what unitary irreducible representation of the prime carré group uh, their wave functions uh, transform. And we looked in particular um, on the effect a uh, rotation, a spatial rotation, uh, has on uh, these uh, degrees of freedom associated with the polarization. With the polarization degrees of freedom um, uh, of the fields. And we found uh, that these, uh, well, the wave function transforms with a, an overall factor, uh, say, just like uh, an exponential factor, which knows about uh, the so called felicity, which we already met in the transformation behavior in, in the classical case for the modes of, of, of the wave function. So uh, the helicity now in the quantum theory became uh, the eigenvalue of uh, J3, so the angular momentum. And uh, two things can happen. Either uh, the particle's momentum is kind of along the direction of propagation, so this J3 uh, component, or it's uh, oriented in the opposite direction. Um, now, we also wrote then down the, the field, F mu nu hat, for linearized gravity in terms of the usual annihilation and uh, creation operators. And these operators themselves, as usual, satisfy uh, canonical uh, commutation relations. And in principle, this is all kind of a particular um, instance of uh, a type of construction which you ha have already met elsewhere in your uh, QFT courses. Now, um, today I will first of all uh, start by talking briefly about now how physical are these um, uh, excitations, kind of these force carriers of the linearized gravitational fields, which by analogy with, say, photons in electrodynamics, well, we call gravitons. So we have kind of a similar idea, right, that gravitational forces, say, between anything, but in particular, say, between two static uh, masses, say, uh, there is a force exchange. It is exactly mediated by uh, these gravitons. Now, the question of how, how real a physical concept or a, a quantity these gravitons uh, are has been raised uh, by various people, but I want to uh, um, single out Freeman Dyson, who is a very eminent uh, well, quantum field theorist, and, and well, he's done, he's contributed also to many other fields. So he has posed uh, since a number of years, well, he's, he's known for his asking of subversive questions, so that it's even acknowledged in Wikipedia, I saw. So he asks, well, how real are these things? So can one actually uh, detect single gravitons? And what he then at the same time wonders, uh, why well, he gives an answer, a tentative answer, is said, well, maybe one cannot. And if one cannot, uh, what does it mean? What does it imply? Of course, we are interested in the question of what, what would it imply for quantum gravity. <coughs> now, what is the reasoning? Of course, the reasoning, in a way, has to do, again, with the weakness of the gravitational field, on the one hand, and how adequate is this kind of particle picture uh, if we you now quantize the linearized gravitational field. Of course, that has to do with uh, kind of weak fields classically. Uh, maybe quantum effects, you would, of course, if perhaps expect in situations where gravity is very strong, so where already kind of classically, this would not be a good approximation. So then the question arises, is the, uh, the quantum theory I build up on these uh, linearized uh, wave solutions, uh, can that ever be a good, uh, can ever a good and uh, physical quantization uh, come from that? Um, now, of course, one can try then to rephrase the question in a, in a quantitative way. Yes? Can we get a, I mean, can we get curvature of 
Oh, yes, of course. You see, because they, you see, the way we introduce them, these FME news, they are just uh, entries in the 4x4, the metric tensor. But, but yeah, but Yeah, yeah, but you, you know, of course, how to compute curvatures. Curvatures tend to be certain, I mean, second-order derivatives of the entries of the G mu nu tensor, right? And now in this linearized approximation, you write G mu nu as 1 plus these F mu nu's. And you can, of course, compute curvatures, and you will then get definite expressions of these curvatures as a function of the F mu nu's. So that's, that's straightforward, and this you would call curvature or linearized curvature. Um, Excuse me. Yes. Why we can require this perturbation field Lorentz invariant? No, there was already a question. Uh, yesterday, you have to be careful, although it looks like a tensor, if you know you have already made certain gauge choices. So you said I look only at uh, the transverse traceless modes. Then that prescription itself is not uh, immediately Lorentz invariant, but you can take care of that uh, in an appropriate way. Of course, it comes from a Lawrence invariant theory. But this was already a question that was asked uh, yesterday. If you want to have more information about it, just come uh, maybe to me af after the lecture. Um, so getting back to the question of the single gravitons, of course, if you saw one, well, that would be, or if you had an experiment uh, that, you know, but we could just see single gravitons, well, that would settle the question. Uh, uh, so the issue is, can I... Uh, well, to start with, can I think up such experiments? And could I, you know, even in principle, uh, build them and make such a measurement? And of course, you're thinking of, you know, gravitational uh, analog, say, of something like um, you know, emission of a photon, photon electric effect, but now for gravitons. So in principle, you have a framework. You have already a framework from, say, QED, perturbative QED. And you can just see, well, one of these things would go through for gravity, and is it possible to detect single gravitons? So there are a couple of people who, inspired by, by Dyson's question, said about trying to make this quantitative, I mean, putting just some numbers, uh, uh, attaching some numbers to this, and, and asking themselves, well, what would such a detector, what kind of properties uh, would such a detector need to have? And I mean, how sensitive, how big, etc., would it have to be? So that is kind of a make a first rough uh, estimate of, of what it uh, uh, would require. Now, to start with, of course, you can say, well, we have already these gravitational wave detectors that are standing there, and I can think of these gravitational waves um, perhaps as, as, as coherent states of, of gravitons, if such a picture uh, makes sense. So is there at any stage... Uh, uh, if I now look, if I estimate kind of how, how many gravitons are contained, say, in a given gravitational wave that reaches the Earth, say, uh, knowing kind of, of course, what, what the energy is, what the wavelength is, therefore, uh, and uh, what the strength of the signal is of various putative gravitational waves uh, that, that reach us from specific sources, say, supernova, can I come up with an estimate of, I mean, how many, how many gravitons are in there? Is it very, very many? Or am I already close to some limit, you know, where I can start thinking about, oh, this is just a bunch of, you know, whatever, 10 or maybe 100 or something. Now, if one does that, if one does make such a uh, calculation, an estimate, um, one reaches a conclusion that kind of a typical gravitational wave, which we expect to be able soon, hopefully, to detect here on Earth, These are very, very weak signals, as I already mentioned to you yesterday. So they have kind of an amplitude uh, of around uh, 10 to the minus uh, 20. A typical, say from the from a supernova, a typical frequency is something like 1 kilohertz or 1,000 uh, hertz, and associated wavelength is on the order of 3 times 10 to the 5 meters. So you, kind of, you can work out you know, what's the expected uh, 
graviton uh, density is, of course, associating with a graviton an energy h bar, h bar omega, where <coughs> this is omega. And the number you get is kind of a graviton uh, number density. And an appropriate reference volume, three-dimensional reference volume, is just the wavelengths cubed. Right. So what you find here is 10 to the 37, and these are just rough numbers, divided by lambda cubed. And if you want, and this lambda is, of course, very large, if you want to see what this is in more intuitive units, it's still three. 3 times 10 to the 14 per cubic centimeter. So you see this is kind of, these are gigantic numbers. Yeah. So the amplitude, what is the unit for the amplitude? It's dimensionless. I mean, compared to, you know, like the metric <coughs> entries, so kind of the F right. menu. Um, yes. Uh, the frequency of the graviton, is this something you can relate theoretically? The frequency, yes, because it propagates at the speed of light. So, I mean, oh, okay, so that, that frequency, well, that depends on the source. So, uh, so now I said, well, this is kind of uh, reaching us from a supernova. So, mm -hmm. there are, uh, in, as a matter of principle, I mean, gravitational waves occur over a whole wide, a very wide range of frequencies. And it depends entirely of where they come from, you know, how big this is. This is something typical. I mean, if we detect something, some frequency like this, how, yeah. how do we know that this is graviton, not something else? Well, you look just, of course, it has characteristic, as you know, as we said, it, it characteristically deforms shapes in the, in the direction of the propagation. So it acts on test masses. And, of course, exactly this is what is used in this uh, laser interferometers. I mean... Well, there are other things, you know, you have, you have like bars and uh, under the influence of a gravitational wave, they will just change their length ever so slightly. So, and you know, that is just due to gravity. I mean, that's just a prediction of Einstein's theory. Uh, so, there are wavelengths of, of much lower frequency. So, for example, if you look at kind of stochastic background uh, gravitons that would reach us, I mean, very, kind of very, very old radiation, then this would be lower frequencies. And then one can also lower these graviton densities somewhat. Of course, we haven't seen any of these things because they are just so extremely weak. But this just gives you an idea that one is extremely far away uh, from being able to claim while we are looking at processes that involve just you know, a handful of gravitons. Uh, we are very, very far uh, from this. Um, now, uh, now to the question of these uh, detectors. So the people who have looked into this um, are uh, Bone and Rothman in a couple of papers. And uh, I'm not sure, but we can easily put the, the references on the uh, on the wiki. Here, this is one of them. Can gravitons be detected? So that's the paper from 2000, 2006. Um, so they asked this question about the detector, and they made very kind of weak general <laughs> assumptions that they want to be in place. For example, they want to have a detector, uh, and they want to uh, have it such that uh, whatever the signals they are looking for would produce at least like one click in the lifetime of the universe. So that seems a relatively mild assumption, but also, I would say, a necessary assumption. <laughs> now, there are various things one has to uh, be careful with. So it turns out, because gravity is so weak, you need uh, very large detectors. But you have to be careful not to make them too large so they don't collapse under their own gravity. And that, te that gives you a size that's known, of course, already, that uh, it shouldn't be larger than about uh, the mass of Jupiter. Uh, now, that sets already an interesting scale. Right? Then they make, so they take this as kind of the, the, the largest size for a, for a detector. I mean, how practical is this is another question. 
uh, they assume there is just no noise, so you, you just see cleanly, you know, just your your, your gravitons uh, 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 zooming by, um, and uh, also that your detector is 100% efficient. So totally unrealistic assumptions. Under this, they can show kind of as a Gedanken experiment, yes, that you might actually detect some gravitons. Uh, now, once they make more realistic assumptions, namely that uh, obviously the detector will not be 100% efficient, there will be lots of noise, so um, neutrinos, for example, are one very significant, will be one very significant source of noise, for example. If you put in those things, then they say, well, then there are no realistic detectors which would ever serve this purpose. So they say, so they make the statement, they cannot see any fundamental reason why, I mean, they cannot come up with any, why it shouldn't be possible to detect single gravitons in some way. But clearly, if you put in any realistic numbers of what it would take, you know, building a such a detector for single gravitons, it's just out of the question. It just doesn't seem to exist. I don't understand yes. why neutrinos would become the noise when you want to detect gravitons. Why? The neutrinos make it make the common noise when you want Yeah, well, of course, they are a source of mass and energy also. Oh. Right. Like, like everything else. So that's maybe then a, a, a drawback, again, of, uh, uh, of talking about gravity. Now, they then turn to a slightly different question, which is to say, what are sources of gravitons, of single gravitons? Uh, and then, I mean, one of the things you can consider, and that has actually been considered already back in, in the 70s uh, of last century, is, uh, for example, to say, well, spontaneous emission could just take place. Just take, say, an excited state of hydrogen, say, and can you compute uh, uh, the transition rate for, say, a, a, a graviton being emitted? I mean, a graviton is just a, uh, you know, a, a quantum of energy. Of course, usually we think of, of course, photons being emitted. But just as well, in principle, you know, it could just radiate out a graviton and then, you know, fall onto a, a lower energy level. Uh, so there has, one can compute the uh, transition rate of such a process. So for a hydrogen atom, to undergo spontaneous emission of a graviton and go from uh, uh, the level 3 uh, D2, under emission of a graviton, single graviton, to a lower shell, 1s, and so spontaneous emission, that is, and you find that there is a transition rate of 5.7 times 10 to the minus 40 <coughs> second. So there is a well-defined computation you can make. It turns out that Steven Weinberg, who quoted this result in his, in his book, in his famous book from the 70s on, uh, on general relativity, got it slightly wrong because he put in some wrong wave function. <laughs> but he was still right within a factor two or so. So this seems to be right and has been reproduced by other people. If you compare it to uh, the transition rate for a photon for that same process, it is suppressed by a factor of 10 to the 47. Okay, So this is something you do not want to wait for to happen. Right. So it's clearly for all practical purposes uh, yeah, totally irrelevant. Yes? Are there any uh, feasible like cosmological ways for gravitational wave detection? Like, Say that again? Are there any feasible cosmological ways for gravitational wave detection, like looking at galaxies yeah, or stars? Yeah, well, people speculate, for example, I mean, one source that's been speculated are, um, 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 what are they called, primordial black holes. My image was you, but of course, no one has seen it. We don't have any evidence that, you know, there are actually primordial black holes floating around in the universe. No. But I mean, like looking at some responsive stars or galaxies to passing gravitational waves, just 
that type of thing. Not not for sources, but for detection. Yeah, well, for single gravitons, I think there, there, there are not very many things people have come up with. Um, yeah, have a closer look. I think Bone and Rothman discuss, discuss some of these possible sources. They are all highly contrived. You know, this is maybe not contrived, because, well, in the sense that it's kind of transparent, the process one, one wants to study here. But, of course, when it comes to cosmological uh, sources, well, everything is a bit floating up in the air, uh, I, I would say. So this was the spontaneous emission rate. Um, now, and uh, so combining these things, uh, one comes to the conclusion that for all practical purposes, it's, it's unclear that if they existed, they could be ever seen. I mean, the very likely answer is not. Uh, could it perhaps be that there is something why they could not even be detected in principle? Perhaps yes. I mean, we, we haven't constructed any watertight argument for that, but this might be the case, and people have advances as a, as a hypothesis. And, uh, for example, if you talk to uh, Stephen Bone, he, he says, well, that means... Uh, so he doesn't believe that these gravitons can be detected, and he, he, he makes the conclusion that, well, clearly, therefore, uh, gravity shouldn't be quantized. It seems to me... That is not something that immediately follows. It seems to me it's logically two different things. Even, say, if gravitons cannot be detected, are maybe not detectable in principle, that means they don't have really a, a, a physical reality beyond making some formal appearance in certain expressions. You can calculate and are seemingly meaningful in QFT. It doesn't necessarily mean that there are no quantum gravity effects in the world and that quantum gravity per se doesn't exist. Right? It might exactly be that there are not useful concepts in the range of energies and scales where exactly you're looking, where quantum gravity effects are going to play a role. It could just be that they are completely useless. So in that sense, well, you could wonder about you know, how, how relevant it is to... Uh, compute, say, graviton scattering amplitude. I mean, you know, there are people who, who like doing such things. So, uh, clearly one has to take all of that with a grain of salt, but for me, the conclusion would be if this were to be the case, that well, it probably gives us a strong hint that just looking for gravitons uh, and looking at processes involving gravitons is maybe not the most sensible thing to study when you're looking uh, for a theory of, of, of quantum gravity. Um, Okay, so that concludes this part of my discussion. And what I want to do now is to, well, we've understood, you know, what kind of excitations we are looking at, and let us now have a look on how to construct a, a gravitational path interval. So how to just go about with a standard quantization, uh, now taking... Working with these linearized fields and their, their quantum analogs, and just construct a standard quantum theory, and see what happens, and also then see what goes wrong. And of course, what goes wrong might very well be connected to the kinds of issues that we've just touched upon uh, uh, in this discussion about uh, how real are gravitons. Okay, so this brings us to a discussion of the path integral. I very, very briefly recap some of the notions that bring us to the path integral uh, that's also done with the view of later on, I mean, now after having discussed this perturbative path integral, in week three, we'll be coming back to non-perturbative implementations because we'll see <coughs> there are some tricky problems associated with the, with the perturbative formulation. Um, so what I just want to do is very, very quickly run through some of the uh, logic behind setting up the path integral and build up also some geometric intuition which will be very useful uh, uh, for us uh, later on. Now, 
let us not, let us, the, let the, 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 the field theoretic uh, uh, side of things, let, let us set this aside for the time being, but make a step back and look at quantum mechanical path integrals. So very quickly, how does one get there? Simplest examples are, of course, that of a non-relativistic particle in some potential, sufficiently simple potential, so that you can attack this problem. Now, how do you formulate quantum mechanics the path integral way? That's not usually the way it is taught in elementary quantum mechanics courses. There, you usually work with operator presentations. So let us briefly uh, recap uh, the difference, uh, or one should say, yeah, the difference and complementary features of these two uh, approaches. So we're talking about the non-relativistic um, particle for the time being. Very simple system. It has a, is associated with a, a <coughs> classical phase space. So let's say in 3D, could also do it in 1D just for simplicity. Uh, the classical phase space is spanned by three pairs of variables, x, i, p, i, i running from 1 to 3, which satisfy these elementary Poisson bracket relations, x, i, Poisson commutative with pj, gives a delta ij. And we had a one-dimensional version of this yesterday uh, on the blackboard in connection with discussing the 1D harmonic oscillator, mm -hmm. if you recall. Now, again, let us look at a simple uh, dynamics for this. One term m uh, x dot squared over 2 plus some potential which just depends on x, which I leave unspecified uh, for the moment. Now, how does one proceed in canonical quantization? Our canonical quantization is putting hats on things, generically speaking. So that means associating self-adjoint operators, operators, xi hat, pi hat, and H had with the corresponding classical quantities. So you, you, you're missing a square? You I'm missing a square. X. <clears throat> oh, indeed. Um, and all of these operators act on a Hilbert space that consists of square integral functions on R3, so that's the original like the original configuration space spent by the three x's with respect to the measure dx. <laughs> now, the, the Poisson brackets get represented on the Silbert space um, in the form of these commutative mm -hmm. records, which are again proportional to delta ij, where now the, the h bar uh, makes an appearance. And the nice thing is that you have an essentially, I mean, up to unitary equivalence, a unique representation of these algebraic relations. So that fixes simply what, what the quantum representation is for these. And that's then the standard. Uh, one way of writing is as, as a, a standard uh, Schrödinger uh, type representation. Where x i hat becomes multiplication by x i. Let me write it like this. You know what I mean. P i hat is represented by a partial derivative minus i h bar d by d x i. And consequently, just plugging this into the Hamiltonian, you get a form 
h bar squared minus h bar squared divided by 2m times now plus squared derivative operator plus b of x. And, well, again, let's assume that this is you know, reasonably nice, so this operator is also reasonably nice. Um, and then what we try to do is to solve the Schrodinger equation which now for this simple system takes the form of an eigenvalue equation h hat applied on a wave function which li lies in this Hilbert space of square integral functions and solves the eigenvalue equation h psi equal to e psi and of course e then runs through all possible energy eigenvalues of the system. Is it too low? Can you not read it? Can you read it? Okay. So this, well, so good, so familiar. This is, of course, what one calls, you know, the, the canonical way of quantizing, writing down eigenvalue equations for the Hamiltonian in particular. Of course, there might also be other operators whose eigenvalues I, I might be interested in, but this is, of course, the, the most important one, uh, and then solve this equation. Now, yes? Oh, it, it's, it's trivial. It's just an, an exponential. It's just an exponential factor. Yeah. So this is, I mean, there's a time-independent Schrodinger equation already, which is applicable to the simple, simple case. You split, you split that off, of course, in the first step. Um, now, equivalently, and well, making time more explicit, uh, you can formulate the dynamic equations for a slightly different set of objects, which of course amounts exactly to the same. I mean, the, you're solving the same uh, the same problem, but it looks uh, slightly different, and that concentrates on the unitary time evolution operator. operator. So I call this capital U. I don't put a head on it. People don't usually do that. Also, it is an operator, so it's the, basically the exponential of the Hamiltonian. Minus I H hat T minus T naught divided by H bar. And the fact that it factorizes in this neat way and only depends on the difference of the t's has to do with the fact that this is especially simple and problem with the, without explicit time dependence uh, in the Hamiltonian. Okay, what are my wave functions? So this is the wave function that has evolved already to the time t. <coughs> I get it by applying this unitary evolution operator to the initial state, right? And um, psi of T naught. So this is how this object uh, makes an appearance. Um, now, what more can I say uh, about the quantum, uh, uh, quantum states? Of course, usually we, we work in a specific uh, basis. And here, well, usually one works in either of two bases, either the x or the p basis. But let us look at the uh, position basis. Let us look at a bunch of position eigenstates. Which are those states which are eigenvectors of x, the operator x hat. So x hat, well, I write it with this vect vectorial thing, so there are three different components, of course. Applied to this eigenvector gives x multiplication by, by x. And of course, you are aware that these x's, of course, they're improper 
eigenvectors. So they're not themselves square integral, but one deals with these things in the, in the usual way. I mean, this is, uh, after all, this is standard quantum mechanics. Now, I can write down a wave function, so in this explicit basis, as a function of x uh, in t by taking scalar product of a, of a bra and a cat with the wave function that appeared down here. Now let us look at, now bringing in, let us now represent this wave function at time t. Let us substitute in this expression so we get an explicit dependence on this uh, evolution operator capital U. So let me look at this for some uh, different uh, location x prime, say t. So this by the above is x prime, bra x prime, psi of t, and let me now for psi of t <coughs> substitute in this expression here. U of t, t0, psi of t0. And let me slightly rewrite this by inserting a uh, representation of the, of the unit operator, a uh, so-called resolution of unity, in between u and this psi of t0. Because this is an improper eigenbasis, I'll pick up an integration, a continuous integration over all intermediate states. Let me call those <coughs> states x double prime. So this is the integral. Of course, if that was in, on R3, of course, I get a threefold integral here. Um, an x prime, u of t, t naught. Here, I have now my resolution of, of unity, a cat and a bra, and my original wave function, psi of t naught. Now, this thing here is, by my earlier, using my earlier notation, is the wave function psi of x double prime at the initial time t0. And this here, by definition, sorry, this is the object kind of I am after. This is a so-called Feynman kernel or propagator. Um, and it depends on x prime t and x double prime and t naught. So kind of an initial time and location and a final time and location. So this object G is called um, the propagator or the Feynman kernel It's, a Greens, it's really a Green's function uh, here for this uh, Schrodinger operator. Now, the interesting thing for us is that this, so knowing this object or having been able to compute this is the same as solving the dynamics. Right? And you see that it is, of course, everything is very closely related. So there is a conservation of, of information. Now, the interesting point for us is that this has a path integral representation. So I can write this object as a path integral. So I write down this path integral, so it's a, yeah, a sum over path. So that brings in kind of a qualitatively new uh, mathematical quantity. And then solving this path integral, well, is tantamount to constructing this propagator. And knowing this thing is, I have, I have solved the dynamical problem for this simple uh, quantum mechanical uh, a system. Okay, so for this guy, I have the following representation. 
x double prime e to the minus i. Now let me write out explicitly what this was in terms of the, the Hamiltonian operator t h hat. So now by t, I have now without loss of generality set t0 equal to 0. Anyway, it's a translation invariant system, so it doesn't, it doesn't make any difference, just for simplicity of notation. So this is my, the object I'm interested in. And the statement is that this can be now written as a path integral. Now, what is a path integral in this simple case? So this is a kind of a path integration with this curly D. That's my notation. Um, and i say in a second what this is. E to the i divided by h bar, s of x and, uh, sorry, of x of t. Now, this is an integration. So x is now an entire path in x space, which is a function of t subject to some boundary conditions. So I'm pinning down the path in some initial and some final location. That's one of the possible choices of boundary condition I can make, which is natural here. So say x at the time 0 is given by some initial point x, and x at the time final time t is some point x prime. So that is the prescription. So I should integrate over all paths, and for each path in x space, I evaluate what its classical action is. And the action, here is the action, that corresponds to my original dynamics with this Hamiltonian up there. Okay, it came, of course, from some Lagrangian, right? Um, and I compute it for each path. So, now, one thing to notice, of course, these paths have nothing to do with solutions per se. They just pass as a function of x, and you can evaluate the action on them. And you are instructed to do this integral, so to do this over all paths. Now, this is, of course, a, is a functional integral, because x is a function of t. And there are just so many, of course, there are infinitely many ways of choosing paths between two pinned down points. Okay, so. It's a functional integral, so you say, oh, wait, you know, uh, le le this is not a priori usually well defined unless, you know, one is careful and specifies exactly uh, boundary conditions, convergence properties. And one way of doing it for this very simple example um, is kind of a, a classic way of regularizing this expression to start with, um, then kind of removing. Uh, so basically hacking the path into little uh, pieces uh, and then making, uh, uh, taking away the regulator. That means uh, uh, making the path, I mean, the, the regularization finer and finer until you are really describing continuum paths as you want to. And uh, let me just remind you how, how this goes. Well, first of all, I should write down the Hamilton. Sorry, so the action for you, so the action depends, of course, on the entire path. So it's again, it's a functional. And of course, you get it by integrating from 0 to t, some integration parameter, time parameter t prime, the Lagrangian of the original system, which is m half x dot squared minus v of x. OK, so Hamiltonian is, of course, kinetic plus potential energy. Lagrangian, as usual, is kinetic minus potential energy. OK. Now, the canonical way of uh, defining this path integral goes as follows. No, this is, oh yeah, this is a fixed, my background, this is my background blackboard. 
Okay, now, um, so we're getting this from a limiting process. Where, let me draw a little picture. So let this be kind of the, this stands for the x direction. So that is my initial condition. The path at time zero is located, is fixed to lie, is fixed to the point x. And this is now time going upwards, and this is my location at the final time, x, x at t, which by definition I said I would call x, x prime. Now, the way I'm getting to kind of the space of all continuous paths is by first considering a simpler class of paths, which are piecewise straight. So just instead of being arbitrary, you know, continuous curves, I make them up from little pieces of straight line. So that's how I start out. I divide the time, in, sorry, the time interval into equal steps, delta t, right, from, from one to the next. And I start by considering paths that links these two points, which are just piecewise straight. So here is an example. That's another example, etc. Eh, no, sorry, I should go to this point. So these are all examples of, of piecewise straight paths. Just a second. Uh, so this is, say, the point here, point x of delta t. This is another point x of 2 delta t here, etc. for a given path. Yes, question. Have you allowed fall back on themselves? No, they advance. No, no. Here there are things that advance in time. Um, so what is my limiting process in the end? So, so the idea is to first make the computation by uh, integrating over these types of paths and then make the, the, the time division finer and finer. So that's what I meant by removing kind of the regulator. That's, of course, an intermediate step, um, and not, not <coughs> what, I, uh, what I want. So what is this delta t? It's given def by definition. is characterized by this parameter n which is just the number of slices in which I divide my original integral. Now, the limiting process consists in letting delta t equal to zero. And of course, it entails that n has to go to infinity. And I then perform the computation I want to perform. I integrate, uh, sorry, from integrating over a particular class of paths, namely those that are piecewise straight. Consisting of capital N segments. Now, if you, you know, who, if you are interested, uh, as I said, this is not usually covered by standard quantum mechanics courses. But uh, if one is interested in this path integral construction, one is often then referred to this book by by Feynman and Hibbs, where this is done, and you find exactly this kind of a picture to construct this uh, path integral. And of course, the point is here. Well. Now, using just simple quantum mechanics, uh, you can for sufficiently simple uh, a V, you can evaluate this in a number of steps. And this is perhaps also something you did in, in, in a QFT course. Yeah, can I assume that is right? 
And what one finds, for example, is you know, explicitly. So what is then, you're of course also interested, well, what is then this measure explicitly? Of course, this measure, as a, as a, uh, using this uh, limiting process, also appears as a limit. So uh, it, it appears as a limit as, say, n goes to infinity of a certain quantity, I mean, just ingredients you get from evaluating this exponential. And the various steps, you insert uh, uh, resolution of the identity, you insert um, uh, a complete set of momentum eigenstates. Why? Because uh, the kinetic term is, of course, an, uh, will then just be... Uh, uh, you will, is of course diagonal in that basis, and you can immediately evaluate this part of the, the exponential function. So as a result of all this, just to give you an idea you know, of the quantities that appear here, h bars, delta t to the 3, n over 2, and then some intermediate, so various, a bunch of intermediate integrations that all come from really doing this insertion basically at every time step. So doing it n times. Um, and I don't have the time to do this here, but it should be probably somewhere in your notes if you've ever uh, done this. So there is a very explicit construction, so it's kind of a hands-on uh, calculation uh, in that sense. Now, two things I want to point out. You know, of course, we started off with this operator sandwich between x double prime and x, which is also from e to the i Hamiltonian times t. Of course, you said, uh, oh, but it's curious uh, that the path integral, this continuum path integral description, ends up with having a, an exponential factor where uh, the action appears upstairs. But of course, you can trace this exactly to evaluating this various well, part of the ca calculation. So this is just what happens if you do the explicit calculation. So the relevant quantity that now appears in the exponent is the original action, not the Hamiltonian. And that's, of course, a, a, a generic. So that's one of the remarks uh, I wanted to make. Now, um, this is not terribly well defined for, well, for ones because what I'm writing down there, and you know what this thing here is, it's not a real measure to start with because it's complex valued. You can still make sense of that because after all, we're only talking about Gaussian integration. So uh, that's something that still can be done. If you want to do it in a clean way, you make an analytic continuation of this past integral, which makes uh, the integrand, and therefore also the path integral measure, real. And of course, in the real domain, you then have clean ways of discussing the, the convergence or otherwise of whatever appears in the integrand. So that's another step that is also very often used in practice, and that the quantity you analytically continue in, in this simple problem, is t. So from this t, to, you go to what is called Euclidean time, which is just differs by an imaginary i. And substituting this in, one can easily see, makes everything real. And of course, then one has to be careful. So if it's an analytic continuation, you can, of course, rotate back and forth happily as long as you're not crossing any singularities. So that's, of course, also true for this type of analytic continuation. But this can be done in these simple cases without, uh, without any... Uh, any problem, so you solve it uh, in a mathematically well-defined way by analytically. No, let me just write it down first. Continue to imaginary time um, tor equal to i t. Yes. So uh, you're saying that if we have a gravitational path and for any manifold, we'll be able to switch between 
with TDN and Lorenz Gang? I haven't said anything of the kind. We're talking about quantum mechanics. And I'm telling you what the standard recrutation is in a non relativistic setting where this T is clear, it's a Newtonian time. Yes. But you can already anticipate that clear an issue will arise that in a theory where it's not necessarily, you don't have one you know, given time, if you want to play the same game, it might not be so straightforward what you mean by a weak rotation. And that's, of course, exactly a problem that will come up and we'll discuss when we get to real gravity. For perturbative gravity, this will not be an issue because perturbative gravity lives on Minkowski space. And on Minkowski space, well, you know, you also have a time, of course, and you can just uh, basically continue in that time parameter exactly in the way uh, given here, and there are well-defined axioms, the osterwalder schrader axioms, that ensure you that if you compute uh, the dynamics, the Green's functions, uh, the endpoint functions of your quantum field theory, uh, that you can analytically continue between Lorentzian and, uh, uh, and Euclidean signature. So there you have well-defined tools. So you just regard, of course, you should just regard it as a trick, you know, so if there is something, an amplitude you want to evaluate, uh, you cannot really do it in the complex domain or not, not easily. What you do is to just analytically continue it, do the calculation, and then rotate back. So in principle, and there is no physical deep meaning you attach to this Euclidean time or the system with Euclidean time. You should just think of it. I mean, usually as just a calculation of tricks that enables you to calculate an object which you know, you're motivated to calculate within the Lorentzian theory. So that's the point of view we'll be uh, taking for the, uh, for the time being. Um, there are, I mean, for the simple quantum mechanical cases, these path integrals, again, given that the potential is not too nasty, they are mathematically rigorously definable. And you always do this in the Euclidean domain. And what you end up with in this construction is really a specific measure over a, a limiting set of paths, namely the, the paths you get by you know, taking the limit as n goes to infinity. So this piecewise linear thing. So there is a well-defined continuum limit. And what you get are paths that are very, are very non-classical in a way. They are nowhere differentiable. So these are, you can think of these as little random things, you know, random walks. You know, they just jump, uh, you know, between different points. Now, the question is, is it something mathematically well-defined? I get taking this limit. The answer is yes. And what you get is a so-called Wiener measure. So that it characterizes just a random process and that, that appears in many, many, many places uh, in physics. Just to point out to you, there is a uh, perfectly well-defined uh, kind of mass behind this, at least in the simple quantum uh, mechanical cases. Of course, if you now start applying this to quantum field theory, even to something like gravity, uh, there's very little you know. But in principle, there is a lot you understand what you would like to have just in analogy with these simple examples. And you see also here's a lot of geometry in there, in the path. What will happen in gravity is you will, the paths that appear in the path integral, they will themselves be geometric higher dimensional objects, namely kind of histories of the universe. So a path will be a curved space-time, whereas here is just a path is just you know, an embedded path in, in some fixed background. Now, so that in gravity, I mean, this is a preview. That's an infinitely more complicated thing, but its geometric nature is actually not so totally different. And the way, one way of approximating these curved space-times will be, again, by approximating by things that are piecewise straight. Geometries that are also called piecewise flat. So in the same way, you know, as here, instead of working with continuous paths, you know, we work with these objects, you can do a very similar thing also with high dimensional geometries by approximating them by things that have piecewise no structure with respect to gravity. So they are flat, piecewise flat, but uh, they can have curvature, and this curvature will occur at the higher dimensional analogs, if you like, of these corners here for the embedded paths. Okay. <clears throat>
that's where we'll be going. And I'll see you back tomorrow.